The Baltimore Orioles were a surprise team in 2023, winning the American League East, and although they did get bounced out of the playoffs by the eventual World Series champion Texas Rangers, people are excited about what they can bring to Major League Baseball in 2024. By the time this video releases, they're probably going to be a couple games back of the New York Yankees still for first place in that AL East, but they're boasting an impressive record so far at the time of recording. There are 7-4, and four, two games back of first place in that American League East, which is probably the most competitive division in baseball this year. With former number one prospects already on the roster like Adley Rutschman and Gunnar Henderson, the Orioles are a very young team and with a bunch of other players that have got called up in the past couple years, they are one of the youngest teams in baseball and look to be poised to make a couple deep runs in October in the coming years. However, there's more people along the way and the biggest name of that is Jackson Holiday, who just got called up on Wednesday this past week. He is baseball's number one prospect, again the third in a row for the Baltimore Orioles and people are really excited to see what Matt Holiday's son can do at the major league level. The Orioles are known for their prospects right now, and a lot of people have questions as to whether they have too many. There's only four positions you can play on the infield, and it's really hard to go ahead and get all of these really talented players playing every day, let alone keep them on your roster. That's what this video is about. Do the Orioles have a problem with too many infield prospects? It seems like all of their best players are in the infield, and can really only play four or five if you want to DH someone, and Adley Rutschman as a really great hitting catcher already takes up a DH spot half the time. So in this video, we'll dive exactly into what that situation looks like for the Orioles and see if they actually have too much depth. There was a big talk this offseason and at the trade deadline last year that maybe they should go out and try and get some pitching or some outfield help with some of that depth, but it might be the case that they're actually sitting pretty pretty with where they're at right now. Before we go on, if you could subscribe to the channel, it really helps out a lot. It tells me that you like the content I make and will get you more content like this, not only from me, but from awesome baseball creators out there as well. And go ahead and answer the question in the comments as well. Who do you think the best Baltimore Orioles prospect is now that Jackson Holiday has reached the major league level? Without further ado, let's dive into the Baltimore Orioles infield prospect situation. I have on your screen now a picture of a blank baseball diamond with question marks for basically all of the positions that exist in a baseball game. You have your pitching staff, which is about 13 players that we're not going to talk about here, your three outfielders, your four infielders, your catcher, and a DH. A major league bench is generally consisted of four spots, and they break down as follows. A catcher occupies one of them, splits time with the primary catcher. You have an infielder, an outfielder, and somebody can generally play both. Positional versatility is very important in today's game, and the bench and oftentimes players in the starting lineup are able to play multiple positions to go ahead and increase some flexibility in your lineup construction. So now that we're only talking about the infield, let's go ahead and get rid of all of the peripheral spots. So that means your catcher, your outfield, and your pitching staff. We'll leave the DH because that does allow some flexibility, and we'll talk about these five positions of where the Orioles currently are at and who's coming up potentially this year in their system. So now that we have our parameter set up of what exactly we're going to look at, let's go ahead, shrink down the field a little bit and dive into what these question marks are going to be filled by. We'll start off by talking a little bit about the Baltimore Orioles current roster construction. We'll begin by talking about Ramon Urias, who was the Baltimore Orioles starting third baseman before Jackson Holiday got the call up. And he's someone who has been a solid player for the majority of his career. He's made his major league debut during the pandemic shortened season and won a gold glove in 2022 with 14 defensive runs saved. It seems like that might have been an anomaly though, as in 2023, that number was back to zero, and he just really hasn't found it together on defense as well as he had during that 2022 season. This year, he's putting up an abysmal negative 33 OPS plus. So that means he's 133% worse than the average major league hitter. Just really not a great start to the season through 22 at bats. We'll see if he can turn it around. He's a career 103 OPS plus hitter, so it seems like it might just be a bad start, but for right now, Urias is not someone the Orioles are really relying on, especially if he can't put up those same defensive metrics as he did in 2022. It is still early in the season, but he has not put a defensive run save up so far this year as well, so we'll see how things turn out for him. But as of right now, he's looking to be an okay bench piece and someone who could have some decent value in the trade market should they look to go ahead and remove him from the roster. The player that occupies that infield outfield slot on the bench is Jorge Mateo, who was actually a very big piece in the Sonny Gray trade back when the A's traded Sonny Gray to the New York Yankees. Mateo has hopped around a little bit from the A's, never actually playing a game with them at the major league level, to the Padres and now to the Orioles, and he's been a solid bench piece for them in the past couple years that he has played with Baltimore. 
He's mostly known for his speed. He is a threat on the base pass. He can steal a ton of bases. He has 79 career stolen bases and just over a thousand at bats. And that's really where his value comes from. His defensive versatility as a center fielder is more as a place of need for the Orioles. They don't really have a true center fielder besides Cedric Mullins. So Mateo is kind of the guy that has to go in and learn to play center field when Mullins needs a break day or in case he gets injured. He really is a natural shortstop or second baseman. He has enough range to stick at shortstop should he get traded, which is a good value for a team. And as he learns center field, he'll be better and better there, but he really is playing that position out of necessity. He's never been a great hitter, a career 79 OPS plus hitter, but so far in 2024, he's been very good. He has a 357 batting average, a 400 OBP, and that's only across 14 at bats. So there's not a huge sample size, but he's put together a solid start to the season and that could help him should the Orioles decide to move on from his services. Just like Ramon Urias, Mateo does not have any more minor league options, which limits their versatility with him as there's not a ton you can do besides keep him on the 26-man roster. This is something that the Orioles have to consider because even though they do have 38 spots of their 40-man taken up, which means they have two available spots, you can't do anything with Mateo and Urias but keep them on your 26-man or designate them for assignment, which means any team can basically claim them. The new starting third baseman is Jordan Westberg, who was their first round pick in the pandemic shortened 2020 MLB draft, the 30th overall pick from Mississippi State. Westberg was a hyped prospect, as a lot of infield prospects that the Eagles have are, and he made his major league debut back in 2023, put together a very solid campaign for someone who was just getting up to the major league level. He's put together a solid start to his major league career, a 309 on base percentage, an OPS of just shy of 230. Decent number so far, and in 2024, he's done a little bit better. Although his batting average and on-base percentage are both below 300, his OPS is 797, so he's hitting the ball for power. He has two home runs already across 34 at-bats. He's put together a decent season so far, and he is a player that the Orioles expect to grow and mature and develop. He's only 25 right now. He just turned 25 back in February, so there's a lot of time for him to grow and develop into a powerful hitter at the major league level. He was a former top prospect, and he's proving that he can stick around, at least at a productive level in the Major League level, so the Orioles are excited to see what he can do in their future. He also can play a little bit of second base, and that goes to that positional versatility I talked about. I could talk ad infinitum about Gunnar Henderson. He won Rookie of the Year last year, also won a Silver Slugger, which is incredibly impressive. He was a former number one prospect in all of baseball, and that feels weird to say given that he's not even 23 yet. So he's still a very young player, but he is dominating at the major league level. He's put together a very solid start to the 2024 campaign, 0.4 B-War at the time of this recording, an OPS plus of 131 solid numbers, and that reflects basically his career numbers. Although his batting average is a little bit lower than what it was last year, that's something that is probably just due to a small sample size, only 43 at-bats. But what is interesting is that he has stolen three bases already this year, given that he only stole 11 last year it might be seeming like the Orioles are being a little more aggressive with him on the base pass, and I wouldn't be shocked to see maybe a 2020 season out of him this year. He hit 32 home runs last year, so he has that power, and he definitely has the speed if he can tap into it this year. Again, he's only 23, reigning rookie of the year, and he has a silver slugger under his belt. I have no doubt he'll probably be an all-star this year and for many years to come. The Orioles are set at third base, and that's why you have a number one prospect in baseball who is a shortstop, now playing second base. As I mentioned, if you move Jackson Holiday to second base, someone who definitely can play shortstop and do it at a good level, you're a great player. And Jackson Holiday is the number one prospect in baseball for a reason. He was the number one pick in the 2022 MLB draft out of Stillwater High School in Oklahoma, and he's the son of former MLB All-Star Matt Holiday. What's interesting is there was another player, the son of Andrew Jones, Drew Jones, who was a lot of people's choice to go number one overall. Although Drew has put together some decent numbers in the minor leagues, it pales in comparison to what Jackson has done, and there's a very good reason why such a young player is ranked as the number one prospect in baseball and has already made his major league debut. He shot his way up the minor leagues. In 2022, he played for two teams, and in 2024, he made the jump all the way from single A to high A to double A, which is one of the hardest transitions in all of baseball, all the way up to triple A, playing in about 30 games there before ending the season. He put together some insane numbers. I'll put some of them on the screen below, but across all those levels, a 323 batting average, an OPS of 941, just crazy numbers with 24 stolen bases, 
you just can't ask for more from someone who at the time was 19. That's right, Jackson Holiday can't even drink yet, and he is batting atop one of the best lineups in all of baseball. The number one prospect cannot drink alcohol legally in the U.S. That is just crazy. He has so much potential and is going to be such a joy to watch. Baseball fans should be paying attention because he has the potential to be an all-star, a Hall of Famer, someone with a lot of talent. And it's not like people like Gunnar Henderson can't, but Jackson Holiday is a fresh new face. And I'm really excited about what he can do. And you should be too. Ryan Mountcastle is their current first baseman. And he was their first round pick in the 2015 MLB draft. And although that does seem like a long time ago, he's only 27. He just turned 27 back in February. So he's still pretty young. He finished top 10 in rookie of the year voting twice once in 2020, and then again in 2021 because of that pandemic-shortened season. So he has his fifth year under his belt, and he's doing a pretty good job so far. He's played a little bit of left field early in his career, and now he's exclusively a first baseman. And he's put together solid numbers at the time of this recording. He has a 302 batting average, a 360 on base, and an OPS plus of 149. That's a little bit higher than his career average, but he still puts together some solid numbers and will be a good contributor at first base for the Orioles. He hit 18 home runs last year, 22 the year prior. So a 20 home run campaign is definitely not out of the question. And he could be a very solid contributor to the Orioles at first base when their lineup is stacked and a lot of people are getting on base. There's a really good chance he can go ahead and get 100 RBIs this year if he can go ahead and hit a couple more home runs and drive in a couple more runs. I think he's set up for success in that way and he plays first base almost every day. So it's looking like that's a very realistic possibility. DH is generally split up into two spots because you have a catcher in Adley Rutschman who can hit and is very, very good at doing that. Catching is very strenuous. It's not something you can really do every day, and you don't want to have Rutschman's bat out of the lineup, so you DH him. He's been very good his entire career. There's a reason why people assert that he is the best catcher in baseball right now. He's only 26, and he was the first-round pick of the Orioles back in 2019 out of an Oregon State team that was absolutely stacked after winning the College World Series. And although a lot of those players haven't really panned out, you can think of Stephen Kwan as the next best example, while players like Nick Madrigal and Trevor Larnich really haven't, Rutschman has really asserted himself as an all-star. He already has one. He'll probably be another one. He has a silver slugger as well. He's a very good player who's going to make a huge impact at the Major League level for a very, very long time. We'll also move on to Ryan O'Hearn, who's the only player we'll talk about who the Orioles actually didn't draft. He was originally from the Royals, played there for about five years before being traded to the Orioles for cash, and they really turned him around. He was a career 70 OPS plus hitter before that, heading for only one home run in 2022, his last year in Kansas City across 67 games, turning it around, hitting 14 across 112 games in Baltimore the next year, going from an OPS plus of 73 to 121. The Orioles unlocked something out of him moved him really to be a basically full-time DH with some ability to play first if needed or the outfield, but really put him in the DH position, said, we don't care about your defense, just go ahead and hit, and he really has. He had a 100-hit season last year, and although he does strike out a little bit more than what you'd like, he still has the ability to be a very good hitter at the major league level. As of right now, this roster looks very formidable. It's a reason why people pick them to win the World Series this year, or at least the American League. They have a very deep roster currently at the major league level. Their outfield's really good. Corbin Burns is leading the rotation, and with players like Yenny or Cano in the bullpen, they have some really solid pieces that can go ahead and push them towards a championship. But this is just what you can see now. Of course, that's not the full picture. There's a ton of minor leaguers looking to go ahead and make a huge impact at the major league level, and a lot of them are knocking on the door. In order to see if the Orioles have a problem in their infield of too much depth, we have to go ahead and see what's coming up. Are there actually going to be enough spots for all of these players? We'll take a moment and see, but first let's talk about some of them, and we'll start off with the lowest ranked of them all, Connor Norby. When I say the lowest ranked, that makes it seem like he's not good, but Norby was a former top 100 prospect, and he easily is probably in the top 150 across almost all lists if they went that deep. MLB Pipeline currently has him 6th ranked out of the Orioles system, which again is incredibly deep, and the Orioles have four players in the top 30, and Enrique Bradfield Jr. above Norby is probably a borderline top 100 prospect himself. Norby was a second round pick out of East Carolina in the 2021 MLB draft, and he originally came up as a second baseman. Because of some of that glut and some relatively weaker outfield depth, they've tried him out in left field, and so far he's done decently well there, although he does have the ability to play second base. I 
see him more as an infielder outfielder hybrid with a good role off the bench. He's a guy who is going to be, in my opinion, a great utility guy who is basically your 10th man. He's not going to be in your starting lineup every day, but he'll probably play 65 to 70% of the games as people get breaks or people get injured. He is the definition of a five tool guy, but they're not a power saw and a drill. It's more of a good screwdriver, a good wrench, solid tools all around that will help you out in the long run. He can hit for average. He can maybe hit 20 home runs, 15 stolen bases in a year. He has decent arm strength and he can field well enough that he'll not be a liability in the outfield. I don't know if he's ever going to be an all-star, but he'll definitely be a good player and every team needs those. You can't have a team full of stars and then have everyone else kind of fall behind. Norby is the guy that you want coming off your bench or playing those 60 to 70% of games as a defense replacement or starting when people get hurt or need a break day. Norby is a very good player and I don't want to get that impression wrong, but he fits perfectly in the infield outfield slot that Jorge Mateo currently takes. The one downside is Mateo can play center field, Norby really can't, and given that the Orioles don't have a true center fielder that can create a little bit of issue, but with Austin Hayes' struggles, maybe you go ahead and trade Mateo for a center fielder who can give you a little bit more value playing there. Right now, Hayes isn't providing a ton of value. I'll put on his stats right now on the screen, and you'll see that he's not off to a great start. So we'll see exactly what the Orioles decide to do from there. But for now, Norby is primed to make a huge jump into the major leagues at some point soon. The next guy we'll talk about is Kobe Mayo, a third baseman who can also play some first, who was a fourth round pick in the 2020 MLB draft out of Stillman Douglas High School in Florida. He is a top 25 prospect in my book. Some rankings have him a little bit lower than that. MLB Pipeline has him 30th, but others have him in the top 10. That's just the part of ranking that is subjective. People rank them differently, but Mayo has the ability to lead the league in home runs, and he can hit for some average too. That's an incredibly potent option to put in your lineup, and he has absolutely torn up AAA. I'll put this here just so you can see how much he's absolutely crushing the ball. I mean, who wouldn't want someone who can hit a home run like that in their lineup, and he's only 22. There's a lot of time for him to grow and develop into his body. He has incredible arm strength from third base, and although his defensive ability and range at third isn't great, he has the ability to improve on that and work on his game a little bit to go ahead and and make him a solid third baseman, and that arm strength will go ahead and carry him to be a solid third baseman. If he can go ahead and get a little bit more average and get a little bit better on defense, I have no doubt he's going to be a multi-time all-star for the Orioles, and now you have someone who is fighting for a roster spot and making a big impact. Both Mayo and Norby have to be added to the 40-man roster after this season, or else they are going to end up being left open for the rule 5 draft and that will absolutely happen at some point so you might as well make it happen now. Mayo has proved his worth in AAA and he's most likely going to push Ramon Urias out of Baltimore. Again since Mateo and Urias are out of options maybe you package one of them or both of them together in a deal get rid of them and get a nice backup setter fielder who can go ahead and play with Austin Hayes or maybe you go ahead and reinforce your bullpen or get another starting pitcher as with all these injuries happening this year you never know when you're going to need the next man up. So we've talked about two players and where they're going to fit. Is there anyone else? Well, of course, the Orioles are flush with talent, but in terms of people who can make an immediate impact, in 2024, there's really no one left. Samuel Basalo is probably the name a lot of people are thinking of as he's a catcher for baseman, but I really don't see him making his major league debut this year. He's only 19 and he's in contention to be the number one prospect next year if he doesn't make his major league debut. So we'll see exactly where he ends up, but I don't see him making his major league debut now. And frankly, you get rid of James McCann for him. That's not a loss for Orioles fans. Because we didn't talk about catcher, I'm not going to include him here. He can play some first base too, but for all intents and purposes, I'm excluding him from this analysis because he'll also be able to play catcher. All the other players, though, are a little far out. We use MLB Pipelines list here. Mac Horvath was a second round pick from the Orioles in 2023, and he's only in high A right now. College players can generally go decently fast through the minor leagues, but Horvath has some hit tool concerns that will probably keep him down a little bit longer to try and make sure they'll stick. Max Wagner was a pick in the 22 MLB draft, and he also needs a little bit of time to go and develop. He's in double A right now. Maybe he makes his major league debut in 2025, but I don't really see it. A lot of the other players are pretty far away. Leandro Arias in single A right now. Luis Almeida in rookie ball right now hasn't even started his 
here in 2024 yet because rookie ball is a half season league that starts in July. You go down the list, rookie ball, single A, rookie ball, high A. There's just not a lot of guys who are pushing for playing time now. Will it be an issue down the road? Maybe, but you don't know where a guy who's in double A or single A or rookie ball is going to end up in two, three, four years. The Orioles have done a great job of development, but as of right now, I don't see a ton of issue with them getting their top prospects into Major League Baseball. I think almost any team would want to have a player like Jordan Westberg in their starting lineup, so obviously it hurts to not have him in there, but is you really losing that much by losing Ramon Urias, who was an average hitter who had one great defensive season, and that's about it, and Jorge Mateo, whose really only value is as a defensive replacement in center field and as a speed threat on the base pass? I don't really think so, and although there is value to both those players, I think Baltimore going into win-now mode can go ahead and optimize those roster spots in different ways. We can also examine the case of the Cincinnati Reds, who this offseason people were assuming were guaranteed to trade Jonathan India, a former Rookie of the Year, and the Florida Gators seem to be out of Cincinnati before the season is going to start. Then, disaster struck. The Reds are known for their infield depth right now. Christian Encarnacion Strand playing first. They signed Jamer Candelario. Ellie De La Cruz has locked up the shortstop position, and Jonathan India seemed to be the odd man out as you look at what was coming up next. Matt McLean was going to be an important part of their infield and their team success in 2024, and then of course the injury bug hit, and now he's on the 60-day IL and might not come back for the entire season. And then you have their top prospect like Noel V. Marte, who ended up getting suspended for 80 games to start the year. That is a horrible turn of events for them, and now after looking like one of the best teams in terms of infield depth in Major League Baseball, they now have Santiago Espinal playing four games out of seven. That is not great. Santiago Espinal is a good player. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing against him. But to have one of the best lineups in terms of depth and then have Santiago Espinal playing almost every day, that's not really a recipe for success. And the Reds are starting to see that that's not really working for them. At the time of recording this video, they're 500, which isn't horrible, but it's not great either. And once they get some of these players back, I think things will be okay. But McLean's now on the 60-day IL. Marte is not coming back until much later in the season, and the suspension was for PEDs, so who knows how good he'll actually be when he's off of them. There's a lot to go ahead and figure out, but for right now, the Reds are looking to make a push after being a very young and exciting team, just like the Orioles are, and if you ask me, I don't think the Orioles have a problem with their prospects. They have enough, and although they can go ahead and trade a couple if they really need to, we already saw Joey Ortiz get traded in the Corbin Burns deal, but at the end of the day, I think the Orioles are fine. They have enough talent to go ahead and win a World Series, and if they really need to, they can always wheel and deal some of their current players with some prospects to go ahead and make an impact. As of now, the players who are major league ready, they're perfect. They have exactly what they want. They can trade some of those younger depth to go ahead and say, hey, we believe in you, but you're a little bit too far away. We have our guys now. Let's go ahead and reinforce what we need. I think that's a better play. I think it's more likely to see someone like a Max Wagner get traded than a Connor Norby, but you never know. Major League Baseball is crazy, and that's what we all love about it. The Orioles are going to be fine. They're going to put together a very good campaign in 2024, and I'm very excited to see where this infield ends up in a year or two. Thank you so much for getting through the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed. As always, there's going to be a video right here in the top left and top right corner. Hit those if you're interested and hit the baseball in the middle or the link in the description to subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to answer the question of the day in the comment, who's your favorite Baltimore Orioles prospect now that Jackson Holiday has reached the major league level. Thank you again, and I hope to see you in the next video.